Awesome, yeah, thanks for that introduction. I'm gonna tell you about a system that we built called Telekeen, which enables secure computing with cloud GPUs. So GPUs are really good at doing things like image recognition. So I'm gonna use this running example of a doctor who has some private medical images of their patients, and they wanna do image recognition on those images. So in an ideal world, they'd be able to upload those images to a cloud provider like, uh, like Google, and they'd be able to run that recognition on a GPU, and they'd get a result quickly. But in the real world, it's not quite that simple, because these are private images, so the doctors should be concerned about the privacy of their patients. Something that could go wrong, as we learned just in the last talk, clouds are constantly under attack, and so if an attacker was able to take advantage of some system-level bug, then they could break in and steal these sensitive images. Another thing to consider is that the priorities of the cloud provider are not necessarily aligned with uh, the doctor's patient privacy. That might not be their first priority. And finally, these cloud providers hire a lot of people. And there have been documented cases of administrators abusing their privileges to uh, steal data. So at this point, it should be clear that avoiding trust in the cloud provider is something that we would like. So let's uh, zoom in a little bit and see why that might be difficult. So actually, when we upload an image to do, to do image recognition, we're gonna pass it to a framework like TensorFlow or MXNet, and TensorFlow or MXNet is then gonna drive the computation that happens on the GPU. And all of this is running on a cloud provider's machine, and the cloud provider controls all of the software, including the operating system and the hypervisor. And so in order to assume that the cloud provider uh, won't take advantage of the data, uh, uh, sorry, to assume, we have to assume then that the cloud provider won't take advantage of the situation to steal the data. So we have to assume that it's trusted. And at this point, I just want to point out that things that are in green are trusted. There's a legend in the, in the top left corner, or top right corner. So if the cloud provider controls the operating system and the hypervisor, then we need some help from hardware in order to realize this vision of an untrusted cloud. And so recently, CPUs have been outfitted with uh, with something called a trusted execution environment, and trusted execution environments are just isolation boundaries that hardware puts up which software can't cross. And then users communicate with these trusted execution environments uh, over uh, protected channels, so the cloud provider can't see what's going on inside the environment, and they also can't see the communication, the, the plain text of the communication with the environment. And there have been recent proposals for these trusted execution environments on GPUs as well. So for instance, you can look at Graviton from OSDI 2018 and Hicks in ASPLUS of last year. And these proposals are robust, and we're, so we're uh, excited to look at uh, next steps for GPU TEEs. And in a, in a, an important thing to note is that these TEEs, as they're presented in the literature, can be implemented uh, by only changing the firmware on the GPU. So there's a, there's a command processor on the GPU that's in charge of uh, controlling how the, the GPU interacts with the machine. And so the performance critical parts of the GPU are largely left untouched in these proposals. And so the idea is that by applying trusted execution environments, we can uh, realize this vision of an untrusted cloud. But that's not the end of the story, because these TEEs have limitations. So you may know that uh, CPU TEEs have been uh, plagued with uh, different, different kinds of attacks. People have shown cache side channel attacks, and they've also been shown to be subject to these speculative execution attacks, like Spectre, that we've heard so much about. And so uh, while mitigations for these attacks exist, the techniques are complicated to apply, and while I think a version of a complicated piece of software like TensorFlow or MXNet that's uh, made to be free of these channels would be interesting, I would rather uh, graduate instead. And so, I, uh, and so uh, what we did was change the formulation of the problem a little bit and thought, what if we move this complicated CPU code over to a machine that we already trust? So we move it over to the client's machine. And so that lets us sidestep the known problems with CPU TEEs, but uh, it also creates challenges which our, which our system will have to address. 
And so we, we do this with a technique called API remoting. And API remoting just means that we're going to substitute our own library for the GPU library. And that means that the application can just make API, API calls like it normally does. From the application's perspective, it looks like there's a local GPU, even though there's no local GPU. And we take those API calls and we turn them all into RPCs, which are then forwarded over the network to be executed on the cloud machine. And they're executed by this API proxy, which runs on the CPU in the cloud machine. And since we're communicating with the TEE and the GPU, all of that communication is protected, so this proxy itself doesn't have to be protected. We just need it to push the right hardware buttons to make the thing, ru to make the thing run. <clears throat> but uh, TEEs still have limitations, and those limitations exist because uh, we, have to, we have to communicate with the TEE. And so because we have to communicate with it, it creates the potential for timing channels and timing channel attacks. So the bulk of, of this talk and the bulk of the work is addressing these communication side channel attacks. So TEEs don't protect against communication side channel attacks because they don't, con they, they don't consider communication uh, as part of their threat model. And communication uh, happens a lot in programs that use the GPU. So there's a lot of management of, the, of GPU execution and data transfer back and forth. And these communication patterns tend to leak information. And I'm gonna show you uh, an attack, for instance, that uses the timing of GPU, uh, GPU kernels to, uh, to leak information. So the plan for the rest of the talk is we're going to answer these questions. The first question, uh, is this a real problem? Can we extract uh, information from GPU communi communication patterns? And the answer to that is yes. And I'm gonna show you a concrete attack where we do just that. Uh, the second question, how does our system remove that information? And I'm gonna show you a new primitive that we have called Data Oblivious Streams, which do that. And finally, we'll talk about the bill. How much is it gonna cost? And I'm gonna tell you up front that it'll cost about 20% for neural network training. So let's, uh, let's dig in and talk about this attack. So in order to explain exactly uh, how this works, I'm gonna have to expand a little bit and look exact, and so we can look exactly, look at exactly what communication is, is going on here. So in order to do this uh, neural network inference, we first need to copy the data to the GPU. So we're gonna, so the TensorFlow is gonna issue a mem copy, which is gonna encrypt the, encrypt the image, send it over the network and decrypt it in the GPU. And then in order to realize this neural network computation, there are several GPU kernels that have to be executed. And so each of those is executed one after the other. I tell the GPU, execute kernel one. The GPU tells me it's done. And I do that for all of the kernels until eventually some result is produced. And then I have to mem copy that result uh, back from the GPU so we can see it. So this attack leverages the fact that the GPU tells the machine when a kernel is done executing. And the operating system hypervisor can look, at these, uh, can look at these and figure out how long it took each kernel to execute. And so we, we built our own classifier based on these uh, kernel execution timings. And we, uh, we, we're attacking this application that I've been talking about, which is just image recognition. I have this image, I put it through this neural net, and I get what class the image is. So while that computation is going on, we're collecting information about how long it took each curl to execute, and we're plugging those into our own classifier and trying to arrive at the same image class without having seen the plain text of the image. And so right now on the graph, I'm showing what our accuracy should be in expectation if we're not learning anything about the, uh, about the image. But when we apply our model, we can see that we're significantly uh, we, we, get a, we do significantly better than random guessing. In fact, for this whole curve, it's a, it's a pretty consistent 1.6 times better than random. So there's information in these communication patterns. How, how can we go about removing that? So our example has gotten kind of crowded and hairy, so I'm going to simplify a little bit. Let's just talk about a GPU program that does a very simple very common GPU program thing, which is copy data to the GPU, launch a kernel to process that data, 
and then copy the, uh, co copy the result back. So we already know that these interrupts cause a problem because they allow the operating system to look, uh, to, to observe how long it took these kernels to execute. And so it's easy to start thinking, okay, well, we need to remove these interrupts, and that's true. But then we start to look a little bit harder, and we realize that actually these, uh, these different operations use different pieces of hardware. And so I can get the same timing information or close to the same timing information just by looking at how long this DMA came after this, uh, this access to this MMIO mapped uh, command queue. So they're using different hardware. That's a problem. And then you start to look at this and you start to realize that there's timing information everywhere. So the commands could be different sizes, and they could be different sizes at different times, depending on the input data. And then the application's use of the GPU at all for different, uh, at different times could leak something about uh, what the input data is. And so what we really need is a more principled way to remove timing information from this channel altogether. And we do that with, uh, with a primitive we call data oblivious streams. So data oblivious streams look exactly like GPU streams from the application's perspective, but instead of forwarding the, the GPU commands across the network directly to the GPU, we interpose our system and we queue the, the commands, and this, these queues gives us, give, uh, gives us a point of control where we can uh, release the commands on our terms in ways that don't leak, uh, don't leak things about the data. And so how do we do that? We have these two independent streams, which from the adversary's perspective just look like two, two streams. One of them is using DMA, the other one's using MMIO. And while that does, uh, it creates a, a small problem in that there are uh, data dependencies which the application expressed by queuing these things on a stream, but Telekin has mechanisms to, uh, to, to, to reintroduce those dependencies. I don't have time to talk about them now, so I'll refer you to the text. Uh, and then we can do things like split and pad the, uh, the commands as necessary to make sure that they're the same size. And then we just release them in a way that's uh, totally independent of the data. And so uh, for our prototype, we just use very simple schedules. For instance, uh, 30, we launch 32 kernels every 15 uh, milliseconds and copy a megabyte of data both directions every, every 30 milliseconds. So now that we all have a handle on what Telekin is doing, at least at a high level, let's uh, look at the overheads. So in order to, uh, to evaluate Telekin, we, we built these two test beds. They both use the same uh, cloud machine, which is a machine in our lab that's, uh, that has a, there's a GPU installed. And the first test bed is, is, uh, is real distributed. We ran it, we ran the client on a, on a VM in, in the Vulture data center, which is in Dallas and uh, the cloud machine is in Austin. And then we also have a simulated wide area network test bed, uh, which we used so that we could control the network conditions for some experiments. So whenever we compare Telekin, we're comparing it to uh, an insecure baseline, which is just running directly on that server machine that I showed you in the last slide. And so we measured a whole bunch of different applications, but right now I'm just gonna focus on these neural net applications because I've been talking about them and because uh, they're important workloads. And we, we tested several different uh, neural network architectures because the, the dynamics of the networks change. The, the amount of computation per kernel and the, and the amount of communication that has to happen changes as you change the network architecture. So first let's look at inference. That's been our running example. Remember, the user just sends a batch of images to be classified, and in the baseline, the user is sending this to a remote MXNet instance, and in our system, they're sending it to a local MXNet instance, uh, but it's being connected to this remote GPU. So one of the, one of the drawbacks to Telekin is that uh, when you're not doing very much communication, the overheads tend to be pretty high. So you can see ResNet here is 10x. But as the amount of GPU computation increases, our overheads drop. And here, when we go to batch sizes of 64, the overheads get pretty close to zero. We also looked at training neural networks. And training neural networks is an interesting workload because in the baseline, the data set already exists on the cloud machine. And so there's no network component to the baseline at all. 
Telekin, on the other hand, has to send the data uh, send the data over the network and also control the GPU over the network. And so uh, Telekin has to communicate at least, the, at least the data set. And as a result, we're using a consistent uh, 533 meg megabits per second. And that's, it has to be consistent because that's how we hide the communication uh, timing channels. But despite the fact that we're communicating over the network, the overheads are around 20% as promised. And the overheads can be low because even though we're doing a whole bunch of extra work, that doesn't interfere with useful work that the GPU is doing. And so if you know something about GPUs, uh, the, the, the CUs can, can keep crunching away at the neural network, uh, doing the neural network computation, even though we're using the DNA engine in the background to copy data back and forth. And so uh, we dug in a little bit to the uh, to exactly where these overheads are coming from, and we saw that about half of the overheads come from uh, come from API remoting. So we, we incur you know this uh, this penalty because we're communicating over the network. Um, there's also some overhead which was added because we have to encrypt, and the baseline doesn't. And finally, uh, there's some overhead because of the the scheduling and queuing components that we add. So that's our system. It's called Telekin. It's for uh, secure computing with cloud GPUs. Uh, we eliminate these secure tiny channels with our, with our data oblivious stream primitive. It's transparent to applications, so you don't have to modify them. And we think it has modest performance overhead, especially for the level of security that we're providing. Thank you for listening. So it seems like 533 megabits per second is pretty hefty cost in terms of bandwidth, especially given that it's expensive. But it seems like you can actually trade off the overhead with the bandwidth, right? So you can basically slow down this periodic access and use less bandwidth, but the GPU might have to wait more. Well, did you explore that trade off in any way? Um, I mean, that, that trade off definitely exists. Right. We, we didn't explore it very much, no. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Uh, really cool work. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, how, how are you thinking about some of the other side channels, as p particularly power and temperature? Particularly power and temperature. Oh, that, that's interesting. So, I mean, the short answer is that I don't think, think about them very much. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, power and temperature, um, they'd have to be addressed through orthogonal techniques. I don't think we have anything that would allow us to do anything there. Okay. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Yep. Okay, great. Let's thank the speaker once again. Thank you, Tyler.